We're, um, we're finishing up the, our series, Five Things That Will Destroy Your Marriage. You know, I promised at the very beginning that we would have a question and answer session. Yeah, uh, of a frequently asked question, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's what I was hoping to do today. But I wanted to kind of give you a heads up. Next week, we're going to start a, a brand new series, um, Defiance. Defiant. It's going to be going through the Gospel of Mark. It's 11 weeks. And we're, it's not promoting you to be defined against your spouse or your parents or the government. It's, it's a different kind of defiance. We're going to look at the life of Jesus and the things that he turned around. Because literally, he turned the world upside down and he changed a lot of traditions, a lot of things that were taking place that were man-made that were going against God. And so we're going to take a look at some of that and see if there's some areas that maybe we need to work on here at the church or in our individual lives as far as the way we look at things, the things we say, and the way we act, especially outside of the church, and kind of breaking down those barriers and going against the norm in some cases because it's a whole lot easier to go with the norm and just say, well, that's what everybody else is doing, than to stand up as Jesus stood up for what he truly believed. But um, back today, back to our last Sunday, I know the whole series has really been based on a pessimistic view because it's the five things that would destroy your marriage. And yeah, that five weeks of that, it gets a little depressing, doesn't it? At week after week, I've been telling you all these things that are destructive, all these things that are, are bad. But they're good because we've got to look at these things. We've got to take those factors into consideration and understanding how can I make my marriage stronger? How can I build my relationship with my spouse? And how can I reunite us back to our dating days? Whatever you, you know, your reason is, we want to avoid those five things. You know, those aren't the only five things, but it's, it's definitely a starting point. It's a pivotal area to focus on. Yeah, you could probably come up with 20 things that would destroy your marriage, but these five that we've covered kind of encompass everything, don't they? And we want to recap, the first week was leftovers, giving your spouse what's left over in time and energy. Your second one was expectations, putting expectations on your spouse that no one can reach, let alone him or her. Next one is leaving God out, and then failure to forgive. And the last one was withheld truth, you know, hiding those secrets that we want to keep dear and to ourselves but sometimes there's, there's things that we need to open up. If we're going to be open and honest with anybody, it should be our spouse. And regardless, again, we all want a good marriage. Whether you're married now or you've got the picture down the road, if we're honest, we want that picture-perfect marriage. And everybody's got a different view of what marriage is supposed to look like and what their marriage is going to, going to look like and what their wedding day is going to look like. You know, ladies more so than men, but we all look forward to that day, that pivotal, pivotal moment, that way we can step into this, this marital bliss, if you call it. But, you know, perfection is, is a hard thing to reach. But I did run across the story of the perfect couple. Um, I'm looking around, make sure there's, if there were any little kids, I don't want to mess them up. There's nothing too bad, but you'll see in the end why I don't, don't want any little ears. So Cody, you know, cover up. <laughs> no, where is Cody? He's hiding from me. Oh, see, every time I joke on him, he's gone. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That works. <laughs> but there was once, once upon a time, you know, all the good stories got to start with that. There was the perfect man and the perfect woman. And after the perfect wedding, they had a perfect family, a perfect life. Everything was going smooth. One day, this perfect couple were driving down a winding road during what was some bad weather. It was snowy, icy roads. They were driving down in their perfect car, everything going beautiful except the weather. When they saw somebody stranded on the side of the road this Christmas Eve night, and lo and behold, it ended up being Santa Claus. So, of course, being the perfect couple, he being the perfect gentleman and he being the perfect lady, we have to help. We have to help Santa Claus to get all the toys out. So they stop and pick up Santa, and they have a perfect trip until the weather gets worse, and they get in an accident. But there was only one survivor. Can you guess who survived? The woman did, because she's the only one that existed in the first place. <laughs> it's slow, yeah, you get it. Come on with it. Yeah, that's, why, that's why I didn't want any little kids thinking, yeah, I'm talking about Santa Claus bad. But the perfect man, yeah, I don't know if he's out there. But some men would agree with that. In fact, I found a status that said, 
65% of American men agree with the statement, a good woman is hard to find. And believe it or not, it goes back even further. Proverbs um, 31 says, a good woman is hard to find and worth far more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. So Proverbs says a good woman is hard to find. I know some of you guys have probably said, man, a good woman is hard to find. In fact, 65% of American men have said that a good woman is hard to find. But you ladies, you have a term for the perfect man or the perfect husband. You know what it is? A rumor. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> there you go. You know, regardless, we all have, you know, an ideal image, don't we? We have this perfect marriage in mind. We all, I'm scared to leave. <laughs> we have an understanding of what we want, the utopian view of marriage. And ladies, you have something different than men, obviously. You know, not just your wedding day, but how you expect your, your husband to treat you, you know, to shower you in flowers maybe every week. You may have this dream of where you come home and he's wearing nothing but an apron. I hope not. No. <laughs> I don't know what you ladies do. I try to stay away from that. No, but we all have this perfect image, don't we? But that kind of goes back to the sermon of expectations. When we get this image that isn't met, we blame it on our spouse. We blame it on you know, the one that we're living life together. And if things go downhill, then it's their fault. It's not mine because I'm the perfect one. She's, she's got things to work on or he's got things to work on. You know, we all want to get to the perfect level. And with that, I found 12 things that will help the marriage get longer, help the marriage soar, help the marriage get to a higher level. But 12 rules for a happy marriage. Never both be angry at the same time or at once. Never yell at each other unless the house is on fire. Remember that it takes two to make an argument. The one who is wrong is the one who will be doing the most talking. Yield to the wishes of the other as an exercise in self-discipline if you can't think of a better reason. If you have a choice between making your spouse or your mate look good, choose your spouse. If you feel you must criticize, do so lovingly. Never bring up a mistake of the past. Yeah, we talked about that, right? Don't use it as ammunition. Neglect the whole world rather than each other. Never let the day end without saying at least one complimentary thing to your spouse. Guys, make sure you do that. You know, start the day off with a, with a compliment and end the day with a compliment. Never meet without an affectionate greeting. You, know, you see older couples, they don't even give high fives anymore, and you're like, hey, what's happened? They, they just, the flames out, as they say. And how can they get it back? Well, greet each other with a kiss, you know, hug. You know, do something to show that you still have that fire for them. When you've made a mistake, talk it out and ask for forgiveness. But the other side, like we talked about, is give that forgiveness. It is a gift. And then never go to bed mad, which I found, a, I found an old guy. He was talking about the fact that, you know, Scripture says don't go to bed angry. Don't let the sun go down. So he was asked, well, how do, how do you do that? How do you handle, you know, not going to bed mad? He said, well, I haven't slept for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> but the truth is, these are just simple steps. They're not ideal, you know, you know to a perfect wedding or a perfect marriage because, Nothing's going to get you to that perfect, you know, atmosphere, you know, because we're two fallible humans. But if we focus on God, if we focus on these five things that destroy your marriage and stay away from those, trying to focus your direction on God, focus your attention on God, not on yourself, but then second on your spouse, then God does bless. He promises to bless. He promises to be with you and be with your, your um, spouse and with your, yourself in your relationship. So it is important that regardless of where you are in your relationship, to stay away from those factors. Focus on some of these things, simple th steps that you can take to make your marriage stronger. But those are just some simple things I want to start with, kind of as a, a recap of where we've been the past five weeks. Today, as I promised, I wanted to look at some questions that you guys had. And we had some good ones, and I appreciate those of you who, who um, asked them because it gave me you know a good good week of studying and digging in and trying to give you guys the best answer that I could from Scripture. So I, I want to add the caveat, if you will, that this isn't my opinion. This isn't, you know, the gospel according to AJ. This is what the way I understand God's Word and how I can 
use God's word to answer the questions that you've given me. Because if I'm answering out of my own mind, then you guys are really out of luck. But if I'm answering from God's word and what he said, then you know, we can all benefit from that. And so the first question, this was really the, the tougher of the two, was how can I overcome the pain of betrayal? And that's, that's a tough subject, isn't it? Betrayal is literally a gross violation of trust. And it can be one of the most devastating forms of pain that we can feel as human beings. Some people actually have said that suffering betrayal is worse than physical abuse, worse than physical pain. And it breaks down the marriage quicker than all of those things. Because betrayal is a disruption of trust. It is a, it's a complete annihilation of trust. Once you've been betrayed, once you feel vulnerable, once you feel exposed, you feel embarrassed it does separate you and your spouse. And that's a hard road to jump over. It's a hard bridge to cross back over that gap because the trust is no longer there. And they get upset because, you know, why don't you trust me anymore? And, well, because of what's been done, because of what you, you did to me in the past. And it makes gap, bridging that gap so much difficult because betrayal is a difficult subject. It's a difficult, you know, ideal to move beyond but you know know first and foremost before we get into the answer that you're not the only one that's been betrayed you're not the only one right now feeling betrayed you're not the only one that's going to feel in the future betrayal is is a side effect of of sinful humans humans being in contact with one another and making their own decisions a lot of times very stupid decisions that affect their relationship affect their life and affect the lives of those they come in contact with and those that they had trust with. Betrayal isn't anything new. And in fact, I found, I pulled out just a couple instances in Scripture that show us again that you're not alone. You know, we've all felt some sense of betrayal. Maybe not all of us in the realm of our marriages, but we've all felt betrayal. So you can understand when it comes to the, the marital relationship that that betrayal hurts that much more. Because David, David gives us a great example. He was no stranger to betrayal. And he, he um, writes this psalm, Psalm 55 says, This isn't the neighborhood bully mocking me. I could take that. This isn't a foreign devil spitting invective. I could tune that out. It's you. We grew up together. You, my best friend. Those long hours of leisure as we walked arm in arm, God as a third party to our conversation. And this is when you can really see his anger. Haul my betrayers off alive to hell. Let them experience the horror. Let them feel every desolate detail of a damned life. That's pretty harsh words, isn't it? That's a hard, hard, you know, sense of anger coming from David. And you're like, whoa, this is is King David talking? This is kind of, kind of mean. He's, you know, God tells us not to be vindictive. He tells us not to repay evil for evil, but David was one after God's own heart, but yet we hear him speaking such harsh words to somebody, and it does sound bad. You know, I mean, he's talking about dragging them off alive to hell. You know, I can't think of any worse punishment than, than that. But that's how bad he felt, betrayed by his closest friend. We don't know exactly, you know, there's stipulations on who that may be, or there's some ideas on who it is, but we'll just take the idea that it's somebody very close to him, somebody that destroyed that barrier of trust that they had in the relationship and it hurt deeply and we see that in the scripture and it shows us that a side effect of betrayal is the closer you are the more difficult a betrayal really is to your life and to the relationship if it's just somebody you're acquainted with and they betray you yeah that hurts but i'll move past you know i see them you know just every now and then but if it's your spouse If there's an issue of trust in your marriage, that betrayal takes a whole new level. It takes a whole new idea of pain, a new idea of struggling, because you build up these walls of trust. You build up this sense of love for one another, but then in one act, it was completely destroyed, completely knocked down because of the betrayal. Also, Jesus, he knew the pain of betrayal firsthand. You're all familiar with Judas Iscariot, he was, he was a disciple. He was a friend of Jesus. It wasn't just somebody thrown in there be like, okay, he's an enemy, but we're going to keep him here because it fits into the, my idea of history and what, how it's supposed to play out. 
No, Judas was chosen as the rest were. He was a friend of Jesus. And, he, and Jesus says in Matthew 26, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who I ate my bread, has lifted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. But Jesus, as we see, he didn't become angry with Judas. He didn't say any harsh words like, how dare you do that, or call him a bad name. Rather, after Judas kisses him to, on the cheek to say, this is the one that I've been telling you about. This is the one that I, I've sold off for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus calls him a friend. He's still a friend to Jesus. Jesus still was willing to forgive him, move past that, and not hold the sin against him if Judas was willing to turn. But that betrayal led to Judas's suicide because he couldn't take it. He realized what he did, and he realized how deep his betrayal hurt, all for a little bit of silver. But I know we can keep on in Scripture of people being betrayed, people being hurt, but these two examples are great examples to show us that despite the pain, despite where you are in your relationship, we can overcome betrayal. We can move past that hurt. We can move past this barrier that's been put in our lives. But the power of moving on has to come from God. You and I, we can't do it. And you know it's true. You say, well, I'm strong enough to look past it. No, you're not. Think about it. If you were really hurt, if that trust was really broken down, it's always going to be there nagging you whenever you're in conversation with that person or whenever an idea similar to something that brings up the betrayal is always there. It's always nagging, always tearing down the little bit of trust that they may be gaining back because you're trying to take it on your own. But if you let God take it, give it to God, hand it over and say, God, give me strength every day. Every moment you wake up, give me strength where I don't think about, where I don't hold it against them. Help me move beyond this betrayal. Because even David, right after he says, send them to hell and let them experience a damned life, after that, after he feels that sort of anger, after he feels that much pain, this is what he says. But I call to God and the Lord saves me. He doesn't say, but I'm, I'm focusing on myself so that I can move past it. He says, I call to God and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon. In other words, he doesn't just pray at one time. He's constantly praying. He's constantly seeking God. And he says, and he hears my voice. Again, this is literally the next verse right after he's talking about hauling them off. This is right afterwards. He's saying, okay, that was, that was me venting. But now, God, I give it to you. I'm crying out to you. I'm focusing on you to get past this betrayal. And so it gives us, if you want to call it, our first key to overcoming betrayal. And that is cry out to God. Pray to God. Talk to God. You know, we want to get revenge, don't we? We want to strike out against those who hurt us. That's our first, you know, automatic response. We, we love the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We're like, I'm going to knock them out. Yeah, I'm going to get them back. But David doesn't do that. He, he wants to. You can see that human nature coming out where he wants to send them to hell. But he doesn't because he cries out to God and says, God, help me move past this. Help me forgive. Help me because it's hurting my own life. It's deteriorating my own spiritual life and my own physical life even because I'm focused on what they've done. And so over and over, he gives it to God. And Jesus automatically calls Judas his friend. And 1 Peter 3, 9 is a great verse on this. It says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. You know how your, your enemy would be very surprised if every minute they're throwing jabs at you or every minute you turn your back and your spouse is doing something else that breaks down your trust, if in return you repay them with a sense of blessing, how that can turn things around. It says because to, to this you were called giving blessing to the others so that you may inherit a blessing. So when you keep, maybe you're asking, well, how do you know God wants to bless me? Well, it's right here. It says so that you may inherit a blessing. It doesn't come automatic. It's saying there's a stipulation. You bless God blesses. You give blessing, God gives blessing. It's, it's a give and take. It's not just, God, I'm worthy of your blessing, so send it down. No, he says, you're not worthy, but despite that, I will bless you. I will strengthen you, but I expect the same from you. So that leads us to our second key to overcoming, and that is to remember Jesus' example. We saw it within that verse we just read with his relationship with Judas and he, he impels it. He says over and over, don't repay evil with evil. But he said, as you've all heard, turn the other cheek. Give, give the extra mile. Give them the, the coat off of your back. 
Jesus is constantly teaching us every time somebody does something against you, repay them with a blessing. Pray for them. Give them a word of encouragement instead of a cuss word or instead of a bad name. Give them some level of encouragement, and that's going to really throw them for a loop. That's going to mess them up. That's what, you know, Jesus, in a sense, was being, you know, really funny, really cynical about it. But it's so true because you can only imagine how powerful your words of encouragement can be to somebody who's constantly at war against you, even if it happens to be your spouse. And so in the minute, in the moment that Jesus was abused, Jesus was betrayed by a good friend, he didn't return the abuse, but rather, again, he called Judas his friend. And it gives us the sense, the idea that believers, we as believers, we as Christians, are to do the same to those who hurt us. We're supposed to give blessings, supposed to pray for always giving the extra mile despite what they've done to us. And so if we follow Jesus' example, it's going to help us move beyond that betrayal. The third key to overcoming that bitterness of betrayal is, is simply our God-given ability to forgive. And I know our fourth week was based on forgiveness, you know, not, not holding that as a grudge or not keeping that as ammunition, but it, it has to be a factor. If you're willing to forgive, literally what you're saying is, I give you a gift. I'm giving you that guilt-free life. I'm, I'm giving that to you despite what you've done, despite how aggravating you've been, despite how mean you've been, how hateful you've been. I give you. You know, that's what forgiveness really means. But not only are you giving it to them, you're giving a gift to yourself that says, you know what, I'm going to move past this because this is hurting my life. It's hurting me you know, emotionally, spiritually, in so many ways. So I'm giving myself a sense of freedom to move beyond this, focus on what God wants me to do, and just say, you know what, this is, this is terrible, this hurts, but I'm going to give them a grudge-free life, and I'm going to give myself a sense of freedom that can only be found in Jesus Christ. But yet, I know you say, well, even if I followed all three, it's still difficult. And yes, it is extremely difficult to forgive a person that's betrayed you, to move on, to do what Jesus said do, to you know, turn the other cheek. You, you say, no, I want to punch him back. That's our automatic response. But Jesus says, don't avenge. Let, let me do that in the end when they're going to have to pay for their sins. I don't want you to have to pay for your sin of retaliating because I'm going to take care of the judgment. I just want you to live as I live. But, again, it's only possible. And, again, I stress only possible to forgive and to move on if we take the power of God, if we accept his strength. And as David, morning, noon, and night, constantly fighting that battle against, I want to punch him so bad, always fighting that. He wanted to send them off alive to hell of all places. He was really angry, but yet, morning, noon, and night, I'm crying out to God. I'm focusing on his strength, and I'm going to let him let me move past this. And so I know we, we can go so much deeper with that question, but I hope it kind of gives you a sense of how we can overcome betrayal. And most importantly, to tell you that, yes, you can move past betrayal. You can move past the pain of that broken down trust. The next question that I was given is, how do we get our spouses to be less selfish? And that's, that again is, is really good. That's it's a difficult question. When I first saw it, I was like, hmm, they got me. Because it's, it's, a, it's a great question. But before we get into that, because there's you know, all kinds of specifics that can come along with our selfishness, our spouse's selfishness, whatever, it is difficult to get beyond that in our own lives, let alone the life of somebody else. But before we get into that, we've got to note, we've got to realize that Marriage is the most intimate relationship that two humans can experience, let, let alone you know, underneath the experience that we can have with God. That should be the most intimate. But secondly, as far as human-to-human -human contact, the, mar the marital relationship is the most intimate relationship that you can have with another human being. So with that said, marriage brings out the best and it brings out the worst in all of us, regardless of where we are. We're Two separate, simple human beings trying to live together in the same house, trying to be one individual. As Scripture says, becoming one. We're trying to work as one unit, make decisions as one unit. But all of our lives, we've been able to make decisions for myself, make decisions that only affect me, not worrying about the consequences that may be on somebody else. Once you get into the marriage relationship, you quickly realize that, oh, I can't do that anymore. Everything I decide, every move I make affects the both of us. 
And that's a big factor. And so what we find out over and over is that at the root of the majority of our marital issues is selfishness. I mean, if we're honest with one another, the root of pretty much all of it, even betrayal. If you're gone and betrayed your spouse, whether that's through adultery or whether that's going against their will, you're being selfish. You're focused on yourself. You're not focused on them. And you just say, well, this may hurt them, but right now it's going to make me feel good, and I'd rather do that. It's the selfishness that's embedded in us that we've got to fight, and that's the battle that is daily and that we see, again, at the root of the majority of our marital problems. And, you know, I wanted, of course, to focus on Scripture. And I know Philippians 2 doesn't focus directly on the marriage relationship, but it is an excellent recipe, if you will, for resolving marriage problems. The passage tells us to adopt. Again, follow Jesus' example. It says, adopt the attitude of Christ. And he gives us a picture of the amount of selflessness that Christ had. Jesus was in heaven. He was beside God the Father. He was enjoying eternity, enjoying heaven with, with the rest that, you know, we have the, the pe- people of history, with his Father of all people, of all beings, I guess you will, because God is a being. But Jesus was in heaven, the most perfect of all places, and he chose to come to earth to become just a lowly human being. He chose to set aside his divinity, to set aside you know, his, his aspect of being in heaven. He was still divine, still God, but he took on the nature of a human being that was completely selfless. And so Philippians is telling us, take on that same mindset. Adopt that understanding of saying, okay, this may not be the funnest thing I've ever done. This may not be the thing that benefits me the most, but it benefits others. It benefits my spouse. And because of that, I'm willing to do it for their sake, pushing myself aside and verses 3 and 4 say just that. It says, put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. But the world today is what? You know, get what's yours. Focus on growing. Focus on learning. Focus on getting your reward. Focus on climbing the ladder. What it, whatever it is, you know, that is our world's mindset of be selfish, literally. You know, focus simply on yourself. Do what makes you feel good. Do what helps you advance Forget what happens to everyone else that you may come in contact with. But that's just the opposite of what Philippians is telling us. And so when that exhortation, when that understanding is applied to our marriage, can you only imagine how many obstacles we can overcome if we just say, I'm pushing myself aside. I'm focusing on my spouse. I'm willing to lend a helping hand so that they can advance. The majority of the time you'll find out that if you allow others to advance, if you allow your spouse to advance, you two advance with, with them. But if you're constantly saying, I'm going to get mine, I'm going to focus on myself, I'm going to grow as my own individual and hope that he or she does the same, then you're not helping the relationship. You're not helping him or her. But if you focus on them, their life is increased. Their relationship with you is increased. And in return, you feel that blessing because you weren't focused on yourself. But selfish ambition selfish desire is is a battle we we've got to face every day just like forgiving just like letting go you know we have to wake up you know i say every time you know especially when it comes to doing god's work i'm like lord make sure that i'm out of the picture make sure that my ambitions are pushed aside because i don't want what i what i really desire to come forth you know i've got these visions i got these ideas and i'm like god I just want your vision. I just want your ideas for this church, for my life, for my marriage. So many times I'm like, man, this would be great. This would make me look good. This would make, you know, my my church look good or make anything that points back to me always get the attention, get the focus. That's that human nature, isn't it? We've got to admit, and it's the same in ministry. We we want the the pat on the back. We want the high five, say, good job, when over and over my prayer is, Lord, push me aside Make me less so that you can become more. That same mindset should be applied to our marriages where we say, I want to make my wife look good. I want to make her advance. And because of her advancement, because of her growth, because of her blessing, I too will experience blessing because I might get a few extra kisses. You know what I mean? No. But that's, that's definitely a side effect of you know, whether you believe it or not. But combating that sin of selfishness requires absolute humility. Unpretentious humility restores and grows relationships. Being humble involves 
having a true perspective about ourselves in, portion, in proportion to God. If we get an understanding of who God is, get an understanding of Jesus' selflessness, and get a picture of his love, then we too will show that sense of love, show that sense of selflessness to those we love, especially our spouse. And the second and third item that it takes, we know it takes humility, which is difficult. It also takes prayer and a love of Scripture. And Psalms um, gives us a great verse on that. It says, turn my heart towards your statutes. In other words, give me a desire for your word, God. Help me love your word. Help me love to read your word. Because I, I know I've prayed it, and I hope you pray it. Say, God, I want to read your word, but when I get into it, I don't have the desire like maybe I used to or that I hear other people have. And so that's my excuse for not reading Scripture, God. I, I just can't get into it. I can't. Get excited about your word. And yes, I felt, I felt that same thing. So don't think, oh, well, all preachers are automatically have this deep desire for reading Scripture. Yes, I, I want that desire. And I pray, God, give me a burning for your desire. I want to be excited about picking up his word. I want to be excited about answering questions that, that people give based on Scripture. And yes, that's fun at times. But there's other times that I'm like, man, I just, I'd rather watch football right now. I'd rather do this. But I want that desire that says, Forget football. Forget everything else. I'm loving his word. I'm, des I'm desiring that moment with him in prayer. You know, I want that desire. And that, again, it's not going to come from your human nature because your human nature is being selfish. But if you say, God, help me have that. Help me focus on you. Help me be selfless as you've given me the picture. Lord, give me that deep desire. It will help us move past that mindset. Because if you really think about it, if we focus on Scripture, we focus on prayer, and if we are truly devoted to one another in brotherly love, in spiritual love, in that love that Christ commands us to, you can't be selfish. If you're truly loving as Christ has called you to love your spouse and your friends, then that means you're putting them ahead of yourself, and you cannot be selfish. So if there's that selfishness always showing its head, always winning, then the sad reality is you're not loving as Christ has called you to love. And that hurts. It hurts me because I'm selfish too at times. I'm selfish with my time, with with the things I get to do on my free time. I'm selfish with it. We all are, aren't we? But if I say I'm pushing myself to the side so that somebody else can advance, I'm loving my spouse, loving my friends as Christ has commanded me to love those. So the reality is if we would focus on Christ, focus on his example, focus on his love, then we ourselves become less significant. God becomes more significant, and those around us, take that step ahead of us where we're focused on their growth. And I know, again, this is another topic that we can keep on digging into because selfishness is something we all battle. It's that sinful nature. But selfishness doesn't get us anywhere. You know, we say, oh, it gets us in the business world. We're always, you know, fighting for that next advance. But really it doesn't. It falls down around you because you're focused solely on yourself instead of God and instead of the relationships around you. And our last question is how can I restore my marriage? This is a, a big question. You know, I could simply say, well, avoid the five things that destroy your marriage. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that to you. Yes, that's a factor. That helps. But those five things aren't the only things that can destroy your marriage. Those aren't the only factors that determine your health and your growth. But the reality is we want a marriage that's thriving, don't we? So often what we see is just the opposite. We see marriages that are surviving. But they're just, well, I said till death do, or part, do us part, so I guess one of us is going to go eventually. And you hold on to it just because you made a promise. So you're just surviving in your marriage. But even if you ask those old timers that you say, oh, well, do you even talk to your wife anymore? If they were honest, they would tell you, yeah, we're surviving, but I'd rather my marriage thrive. I'd rather our marriage go to the next level to, to really get to know one another, to get back to our dating days. I want that type of feeling in our relationship. But too often, you know, when it comes to restoration, we're just in survival mode. Just get on to the next day, do our chores, do our work, and maybe I'll live to see another day. And that's it. But regardless of where you are, regardless of the reason for why you want to restore your marriage, the place to start is with the individual. You're, you know, focus on yourself, not your spouse. This is where you can be a little selfish. Focus by starting on your relationship with God first and foremost. If you start there, then you're saying, okay, God's the forefront. 
God's my number one priority. God's my number one relationship. If you start there, and if your spouse starts there, God will help reunite and restore the bond between the two of you. But this goes, again, if you're a Christian, a born-again Christian, you know, to outsiders, they say, well, I'm not really worried about that relationship with God. Then God's not a factor in the, the marriage triangle at all. But over, I'm going to have to talk loud now. Over and over, we see, man, the success of any relationship with others. Man, it's loud. <laughs> well, you can read it. Nah. The, well, no, it's on the wrong slide anyway. Nah. The success of any relationship with others is in direct correlation with the quality of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When we are out of fellowship with Him due to sin, due to our mental attitude, man, I'm really loud now, aren't I? <laughs> if we're going against His will, then we find that we're out of sorts with our... <laughs> oh, my land. We're out of sorts with ourself. That leads and spills over to the fact that we're out of sorts with our spouse, with our friends. But if we focused on God, if we focused on His will, His desire then that blessing also overflows out of our own lives into the lives of those around us and into our spouses. So the starting point in restoration is restoring our relationship and fellowship with God, focusing on our relationship first and foremost on Him and letting Him restore the relationship with our spouse. And I, I can, again, dig really deep as far as what Scripture has to say about marriage, and there's... I, I'm going to give you more or less homework to take with you. There's a couple of verses that I really can't dig into right now because we're almost out of time, and you can't hear me anyway, probably. <laughs> but we, God gives us a lot of instructions, gives us a lot of models for marriage, and that marital mo model does help us in that restoration, does help us to move into that deeper level, move back to that dating stage, if you will. 1 Corinthians 7 lays down some great principles and practical, personal-led, you know, spiritual advice for a couple, for a marriage. But also Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, these are great starting places for you to look at. If you're saying, okay, what is God's model for marriage? What is God's understanding of marriage? Then 1 Corinthians 7, Ephesians 5, and Colossians 3 are great starting points. Colossians 3 even notes, and this goes into every, every area of our lives, but especially in our relationship with our spouse. It says, whatever you do, work at it with you, all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Or in other words, you could say, as if working for the Lord, not for your spouse. Again, pointing over and over back to the fact that focus on God first, put Him as your highest priority, and then put your spouse ahead of yourself. He's going to help you advance. He's going to help you restore that relationship. But I know Ephesians 5 especially, there's some issues with that, with the wording in the, in the scripture. And I've heard many people say, you know, well, I don't really like that marriage model. I don't really like the way it sounds. One being, wives submit to your husbands. And yes, you say, oh, that's, that's not how our relationship works. That's not how our marriage works. I don't submit to nobody. And okay, that's, that's an issue. But realize that the responsibility isn't on the wife alone. God calls us in the mar marriage relationship as husbands to love your wives as Christ loved the church. If we loved our wife as much as Christ loved the church, that means you're going to submit to your wife. That means you're going to sacrificially love her. That means you're going to be willing to push aside your self, selfishness and become more humble towards them to say, I want you to advance and I want me to decrease. I want you to grow and I want you to push me to the side. If we love as Christ has commanded us to love, then yes, husbands, you too will respect. You too will submit to your wife. So it's not a one-way street. It's not a domineering factor that some guys have used in the past to say, you got to listen to me. You got to do what I say. You got to respect me. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, husbands, you too submit. You too sacrificially serve your wife. It takes it to a whole new level. But also wives, in that aspect of submitting, which we don't like that word, what, he's, what Paul's actually saying is love your spouse to the point where you push your own desires away. You serve your husband 
in a way that you say, I would like to be served this way. Christ has served the church this way, so I'm going to serve you this way. He, said, he says, submit to your husband as the church submits to God. It's a big, big responsibility. But the responsibility isn't just on you ladies. It's on us guys. It's, it's back and forth. So yes, we could also say husbands submit to your wives. Because if we truly love as God has called us to love, that submittance is going to be automatic. It's going to be a part of the package deal where we can't help but submit. We can't help but respect because our love is that deep. So don't think of that scripture as a domineering of husbands over the wives. Yes, he gives us a picture that husbands are, in a sense, the head of the household as Christ is the head of the church. But it's a two-way street and it's responsibility on both individuals both spouses to take that relationship to a deeper level i i found a a great passage or it was a quote from um matthew henry he he said there's a reason that god chose a rib out of adam to form eve he didn't take it out of the head to say that the man is over the woman and he didn't take it out of the foot so that the woman will be trampled by the man but he took it out of his side to say She's going to work alongside me. She's going to be right there every step, not as a lesser human being, not as a domineering human being, but being on the same level, working together, submitting to one another, sacrificially loving one another. So, yes, we may not like the word submit, but husbands, we too should submit sacrificially and love sacrificially in a way that will help restore your relationship to a whole new level. And so, yes, God's marital model does work, but it takes commitment on both of you. It takes commitment. It takes a deep level of focus for both of you. So how do you restore marriage? Focus on God. And focus on His model. And focus on learning how to love sacrificially. Let's pray.